If you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to the book of Jeremiah, <coughs> Jeremiah 32. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 32, and we're going to begin reading in uh, verse 17. Jeremiah chapter 32, beginning in verse 17. <coughs> The Bible says, O oh, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Thou showest loving kindness unto thousand, and recompensest the iniquity of the fathers unto the bosom of their children after them. Great and the great and mighty God, the Lord of hosts, is his name. Great is his counsel, and mighty in work. For thine eyes are open upon all the eyes of the sons of men, to give everyone according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings, which set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, even unto this day, and in Israel, and among other men, and has made thee a name as this day. And has brought forth thy people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs, and with wonders, and with a strong hand, and a stretched out arm, and with great terror, and has given them his land, which thou didst swear to their fathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for an opportunity to be in your, in your house and with your people. God, this morning we pray that you would bless your word, that you would take it into the hearts of the hearers for the redeemed, Lord. You would use it to draw them closer to you and to the lost, Lord, that they might understand and know uh, their position in your judgment. God, forgive them, save them according to your mercy and grace. We'd be faithful to give you the praise for it, for it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Now, uh, the text we have this morning, and if you know the book of Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah wasn't in a, it isn't a book where you sit down and it's just one pleasure right after another. Uh, Jeremiah re wrote and spoke in the days just preceding the full judgment of God falling on Israel. He, he lived in a day that he said judgment is coming. Judgment is coming to this nation. Judgment is on its way. And he lived to see the people he preached to just laugh and sneer at him. And then when judgment comes, you know, you remember when judgment came and uh, or whenever uh, Jonah preached uh, and the uh, city repented and then he got mad because they repented. And, and that, that was his attitude toward the ministry. And you would think, as, and I understand his ministry lasted about 30 years, as much as uh, Jeremiah preached to those people, he would have said at the end, you got what was coming. But that wasn't what happened. Then you have the Lamentations of Jeremiah, where there's five other chapters where he laments, he's sorry, he feels awful for those people. Now that's the attitude of a true prophet. He doesn't say, see, he got you, he loved them. And so he, he gives this uh, unbelievable prediction of judgment, but right in the middle of this uh, chapter that is entirely about being the wrath of God literally poured out on man, you have this slim uh, few verses that speak on the goodness of God, his ability, his strength, his goodness, his kindness, right in the middle of a horrible time of judgment. Now, if nothing personifies the USA today, that is us. You know what? In the middle of full, the full judgment of God, pending on the destruction even of this country, right in the middle you have a few people that see God for exactly who he is. And that's where we need to be. That's, that's the people we need to strive to be. And sometimes I think in the modern day, we forget just who it is we serve. We serve the great God Jehovah. We serve the, we serve the one that spoke all things into being. Uh, uh, we, uh, 
We serve the one that does everything after the counsel of his own will. We serve God. What could be better? What, what, when, when everything is falling apart, knowing, knowing him who created the situation, what could be better? And sometimes we forget the characteristics of God. And certainly it's a ministry of the devil to, to, to get us in this situation where we really aren't sure what's happening. So in verse uh, 17, Jeremiah writes, Oh, Lord God! He, he, he gets a glimpse of who his Lord is. In, in, in sure destruction that is coming, he says, Oh, Lord God! Uh, you know what? Sometimes when you're out of solutions, you'll see who God is. When, when, when there's nothing else working, that's when God begins to move. He, he certainly remembered that despite everything that was happening, nobody was listening, nobody was repenting, God was still on the throne. Uh, oh, Lord God! Behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm. Now, that's an amazing thing. If you've ever, if you've ever traveled very much and, and you look down and, and, and you see how finite, even from the wind of an airplane, which we, it doesn't get very high, but still, when you look down and you see how small and finite the world really is, the earth is, you're, you're just amazed. God created I remember probably the most meaningful flood I've ever had. I was preaching in northern Idaho at Matthew's father-in-law's church. And you, you, to appreciate the air system, you know, straight lines mean nothing to the aerodynamics people. They took me from... Uh, northern Idaho to Phoenix to Atlanta and then back to Tennessee. That's one big circle. And, and uh, when going through over the Mojave Desert, miles and miles and miles of nothing. And most people even don't even realize that we have a desert. Do you know that's the biggest desert in the world? And it's just acre upon acre upon acre upon acre of nothing. Our God made that. It, it was after the counsel of his own will. And you know, you know, as, uh, as uh, growing up in a farm community, what we would like to see is acres and acres of flourishing land. But he does everything. And you know what? I don't know what it is, but we need that dry, arid air out there for something. Mm -hmm. And you know what? We wouldn't, if it, if it wasn't needed, it wouldn't be there. He does everything. And so when we look on this vast universe, it, it's unbelievable to think that God spoke it into a place, and yet he did. Even greater than that, verse 18. For thou shewest loving kindness unto thousands. Now, the Bible in another place says, that it rains upon the just and the unjust. Now, those of you who are not yet redeemed and saved, think about all the good fresh air you breathe into your lungs every day. Think about the food that you eat. That uh, he, he, he rains on the just and the unjust. He, he is a wonderful, wonderful God. And, and so when we think about how good he's been. Think about how good he was you before, to you before the Lord saved you. Think about him putting you in the exact place, at the exact time, at the right moment to be saved. That's amazing. You could have been anywhere else, but you were in the right place at the right time. And you know why? Because God spoke it that way. And, and so Jeremiah begins to appreciate and begins to praise God for whom God really is. Not who we want to think he is, as Brother Jared was teaching, but exactly whom he is. Thou shewest loving kindness unto thousand, and recompense, recompentest the iniquity of the father into the bosom of their children after them. Now, 
in this midst of praise, he reminds God's people of this slim truth. You're going to pay it to your children. Isn't that about the most humbling thought that the Bible has to offer? You're going to pay through your children. The Bible says up to the third and fourth generation. Right. That would mean huh, all the way from Brother Junior and Diane all the way down to AJ. That's a long, long time. But you know what? That's our God. Uh, isn't it wonderful when you begin to think not one thing slips by the Almighty? You know, we when, when you hear somebody say, oh, he's all-knowing. Amen! Well, you think that long and hard before you amen it too loud. Because he absolutely knows the intent of our hearts. Now, that's pretty humbling to me. That, that'll make me shut my big mouth, right? And, and, and so we see then that the Lord that we serve goes so much further than the, the Lord that, that, uh, that, this, that this world wants to worship. Then he says, the rest of verse 18, great, <laughs> the great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts, in is his name. Great, mighty. Do you ever think that there's something that the Lord can't do? Uh, I think I've been in those situations, don't you? That this is impossible. Uh, I'll tell you what is the best measure of your faith. Who do you want to run to when it's all falling apart? You, you run to the one you can believe to get, uh, get, get, get the job done. Uh, when Adam was 16, he rear-ended a Lexus, probably the only Lexus in Stewart County. And uh, he, uh, he called me, and he said, Dad, his first thing was, Dad, I'm okay. And No, the first thing he said was, Dad, I'm sorry. And I said, are you okay? And he goes, I ran into the car. I was like, well, we'll, we'll make it right. Uh, what kind of car was it? Alexis. I'm like, Adam. <laughs> and... But, you know, my first concern was that he was okay. And his first thing to do was to call for his father. You know what the first thing we ought to do is call for our father. That's right. When, when, when we first get the news that something horrible lies yeah. ahead, yeah. call for your father. Call for the Lord Jesus Christ. Cry out to him. Cry out to the mighty God Jehovah in the name of Jesus Christ is how we're taught to pray in the Bible. And, and, and he, he will do everything that is, that is just and right. Verse 19. <clears throat> Gray in counsel. Now, uh, I didn't have much counseling and in my nursing degree we had to take a lot of psychology classes and but today counseling is summed out like this honey you do anything that makes you feel good that's the doctrine of the flesh that that is a truth that does not exist we need to go with the counsel of God we need to go with what the Bible says. So when, when uh, Jeremiah wrote, Great is thy counsel, he was writing that to a people that would not take the counsel of God. Now, before we can get involved in this praise that Jeremiah was obviously thrilled with, we have to say, okay, am I going to take the counsel of God? And sometimes it's not what we want. You know, you know what mankind wants to hear always? Everything's going to be all right. You know what? This is the reality. Sometimes it's not going to work out all right. 
Sometimes you're going to see that lid closed on the coffin. Sometimes you're going to have a doctor walk away and shake his head. And then there you have to say, this is the counsel of the Almighty. The Bible again says, he doeth what seemeth good to himself, and that he worketh all things to our good. So we have to assume that's right. So when we say, yes, I'm going to take the counsel of the Almighty, remember, take it. You said, hey, I'm going to take it. When it seems outside that even what makes sense, do what God has said. And, and that was Jeremiah's excitement is that he understood and knew that the counsel of God was perfect and that it was, it was glorious and it was great, great in counsel and mighty in work. <coughs> Every work, there's, there's nothing, there is nothing our God can't do. And, and, and that, that is almost cliche in the modern day. But if we begin to live it and we begin to grasp it as truth, it becomes the most exciting thing that we could possibly think of. He is mighty in all his ways. Then Jeremiah backs it up. For thy eyes are open into all the ways of the sons of men. Again, very humbling verses. Nothing gets by, nothing's not seen. You, you, you think about the horrible uh, day which we live, uh, and you say, why doesn't God do something? He what? I taught school for three years, three and a half years, uh, nursing. And you know what? During the test time, nobody said nothing, and neither did I. I just walked up in and among them, watching. You know what, church, this is test time. Master's being quiet. He's seeing what you're doing. It's the time to test your ability. It's time to test your knowledge. And, and so you might not hear from the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, but I want you to see that he certainly knows what's going on in your life, and he is, he is supporting you in every way. Upon all the ways according to his ways, and according to the fruit of his doings. I mean, again, God is in control. Verse 20, which has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. Now, there was a great, a great unbelievable judgment of the nation of Egypt, and, and it was such a powerful and mighty nation, and they got so much wealth in the plains of the Nile River, and, and when everybody else was starving, they still had food. They were a unbelievable, nobody thought that Egypt would be conquered. But you know what? Nothing but a graveyard now. Very little wealth in Egypt. You know, this, this is one thing that amazed me. Uh, never been there, uh, but it, from outer space, from our space shuttles and stuff, the only two structures that are visible from outer space is the pyramids and the Great Wall of China. So they, they, even, they even make a statement there, but think about the pyramids. They're full of dead men's bones. Mm -hmm. That's all they are. Beautiful, and I've heard people go there and say that they're amazing and an unbelievable ar architect. But that's all they are. They have these great and wonderful things, and there's nothing in them but dead things. You know, that's the nature of this world, is it not? Wonderful, great things going on and thousands going in. And, and, and what really, when you get in there and, and, and you see it for what it is, all it is is dead men. And so he reminds them of the judgment of Egypt. That came from our God. He set us free, which has set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, up, even unto this day. And in Israel, and among other men, and has made thee a name and, and has made thee a name as this day. You know, for some 2,000 years, Israel was not a nation. 
But everybody knew where Israel was. Their name never has gone out of existence. Is that not amazing? There has not been one time that people did not know what the, what the land of Israel was all about. And, and so we see even today that, that, he, that he has been faithful to them. That is the God that we serve. And has brought forth the peoples, the people, and has brought and has brought forth thy people Israel out of the land of Egypt with sons and with wonders and with strong hand and with a stretched out arm with great terror. Now again, you think about the Almighty. Now uh, back in December last year, almost a year ago now, <clears throat> that terrible tornado came through where we live or close to where we live and uh, brother diane and sister ginger's house was hit pretty hard ripped the roof off their other building and, but you know what what is it? maybe 1500 yards from their house was a house that was destroyed that's what our god can do and, and, and see, you know who led that swimmer and say, well, the devil did that. Don't give de the devil undue credit. The devil is not the creator of the wind. The Almighty is. Amen. And, and he guides tornadoes just like he guides me and you. And I, I don't know why it happened. Maybe it was to test some faith. Maybe it was to test the faith of this people. I, I don't know what it was about, but I do know this. It was no accident. And I do know this, I've seen two people come out of it just fine. See, that's, that's the God of the Bible. And, and so we find that then that the Lord is mighty in all his ways, and, and that should be the most easy, the most, uh, the, the, the most rest assurance that God's people could possibly have. Now, here we are 2,000 years later, uh, and we're pretty, well, actually, Jeremiah lived long before Christ, so I guess you could say more like 2,500 years later. And, and, and God's people and their understanding of God still wanes. Do you not think that is? Do you, do you, not, do you not sometimes doubt the ability of the Almighty? I do. I'm just being frank and honest. When, when, when grim news comes in, I don't always run to Christ first. Sometimes it's after I've thought about it for a while. And shame on me, but at least I have the grace to be honest about it. And if you be honest with yourself, you're in the same situation, and that is nothing new. Now go with me back to Exodus chapter 16. Remember, uh, God's people had just been delivered from Egypt. They had been delivered from the land of sin. They had been in bondage for 400 years, and God had given them great, a, a wonderful, great, and mighty deliverance. Four and a half million people set free from four centuries of slavery. You know, that's what happened when the Lord saved you. You were set free. <laughs> you, you were bought with Christ. You came back. <laughs> he took you out of that situation and put you as a, a wonderful freedom from sin. Now, that's what he did to them. So you can think about in your own mind when the Lord saved you and how long you may or may not have served him initially when, when he saved you. But look at Exodus chapter 16, and, and this sums up the, the journey of many. In the first verse, and they, meaning the nation of Israel, took their journey from Elam. Now, Elam was the place of celebration. Elam was the place where they give great glory to God for their deliverance. And all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of sin. Now, do you know where we still abide as God's people? In the wilderness of sin. Why do bad things still happen? Because we live in this earth. This earth is accursed, 
and it is the wilderness of sin. Why do bad things happen? Because we dwell in the wilderness of sin. Now, what, what was the other hallmark of this people? They were not yet where they were going to be. <laughs> And we aren't either. We're, we're not yet. We're, you think about the glory and the wonderful time when we get to heaven. We're not yet. We're pilgrims and strangers. This world, this world doesn't belong to us and we do not belong to it. That's why you're a square pig uh, trying to fit into a round hole. It is, it is not our place. Amen. And they rejoiced in deliverance. They gave God praise. They appreciated Moses and Aaron, but now look, they're in the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 14th day of the second month after departing out of the land of Egypt. Now, if you keep up with the time, time uh, schedule of Israel, They've been out in sin for two weeks. They couldn't see Egypt anymore. They had crossed the Red Sea. You know, sometimes it's alarming, isn't it, when you can't see the lights of home anymore. Now, in their defense, their only familiarity was Egypt. And you know what? Before the Lord saves you, the only familiarity you have is sin is dwelling as a simple creature and being in that place. And, and I want you to see, and this was, this was God's trajectory, not, not, not theirs. God takes newly set free people and they're still, in the, they're still in the wilderness of sin. Now that is hard on a new believer. You know, uh, that, that is a very difficult thing. Verse 2. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we would die by the hand of the Lord uh, of the Lord in the land of Egypt, where we sat by the flesh pots, and we did eat bread to the full, and you brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now I want you to see, don't let this mind play trick. This, this brain, this mind is just as sinful as it's ever been. Your inward man is the only thing that's redeemed. Now, they said, would to God we go back for the flesh pots and the bread. But in reality, does anybody remember what their diet really consisted of in Egypt? Leeks and garlics, that was it. Now, I, I like garlic spice, not too heavy. But can you imagine getting a big garlic, you know? I, I don't know that I can get it down. Mm. And you know, garlic, if you eat enough of the garlic, makes you smell like garlic. Have you ever thought about that? I, I've known a few people that did, you know? You knew when they got in the room. Uh, and... Leeks, not much, not much to them either. It's kind of like a, yeah, yeah. And they didn't have what they said they had down there. You know, I've seen a lot of people almost rejoice when they look back on their sin. And that, that despite why the flesh tells you that, there were no good times to be had there. It, it, it wasn't something to look back and say, man, those were some good days. And I, I've heard sound men even Absolutely. say that. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Those were the, those were the leeks and the garlics. You know what? I, I have the nutrition now. And so the, the, the foolish uh, believers <laughs> said, oh, I want to go home. I want to go back to sin. That's where I belong. Verse 4. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will bring, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the, she, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, and I will prove them 
whether they will walk in my law or not. Now, I want you to notice two things. What if they had waited? You know, the most difficult thing you will ever do is wait on God. That's why patience is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Because we do not have it. And today is even worse than I was a boy. We live in a day of instantaneous things. Now, our younger generation will think, I remember the first microwave I saw. It looked like a floor model TV. And most people don't even know what a floor model TV is. <laughs> and uh, that was a way to get it quicker, wasn't it? And then they improved on them, improved on them. And now we get frustrated if we're car number three at the drive thru. You see what I'm saying? They go now. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. So he said, uh, you know, in the entire journey, and they've been out, what's the Bible say? Two weeks. How far were they, how far from the Red Sea is the land of promise? About a two week journey. You know what that says to me? You cannot, man, it's just not in our ability to wait on God, is it? It's just not there. And, and, and so we find what they do is they begin to grumble and God gives them some manna. Now, uh, the meaning of manna in the Hebrew language is what is it? You, you know, when you, when you say what is it, why do we say that? What is it? And it's a refrigerator magnet, right? And because we don't understand it. So they, they, when man came down, their attitude is, what is it? I don't understand this. Well, don't put it in your mouth. It's the provision of God. So sometimes I think we have the provision of the Almighty, and we're no better off than they are. It, it's, what is it? <laughs> you know what? Every one of us got up, came to church today. What is it? Everybody had a little something to eat before they left the house. What is it? Everybody that's saved has an internal being in here that one day will sit at the feet of Christ and give Him praise and glory throughout the ceaseless ages. What is it? Do you have it? What is it? Now, it was never the plan. Well, I'll put it this way. He knew what was going to happen. But it wasn't, the, it wasn't the ideal will, the perfect will of God for them to eat on that mess for 40 years. But their rebellion made it happen. Mm -hmm. And you know when I believe they finally understood what manna was? When all that bunch was dead. The what is it generation. You know, uh, we're there, is it not? Now, I don't know all this generational stuff, but I think me and Donna's generation, they call us Generation X. Well, at least from what little algebra I know, you can solve for X, so I don't know what the younger ones are, right? But we're in it. We're in the what is it generation. Nothing's wrong and everything's right. What is it? And you know why that's significant for God's people? Because we, if we study the Bible, we know what's going on, right? But sometimes I just look at me and Brother Jody was talking about the senatorial elections that are, are now passed. And you know what? The results are discouraging. Mm -hmm. And you can't help but doubt them. What is it? You know who are the senators this morning? Exactly what who God wanted them to be there. Amen. And if they got there by cheat, you know what? God wanted them there anyway. If we lost one Senate seat, so what? What is it? You know what? My God's in control. He's sovereign. So don't stress out, church. 
This, this is not ours to possess. Uh, you know, and, and Adam taught me this when he was in about the homeschool. Uh, Israel barely got a tenth of what was promised to them because they doubted God. The nation of Israel would have been ten times as large as it is today if they simply had not said, what is it? You know, we, we need to trust our God more and more and more as the years go by. Has He ever let you down? He has never let me down. He, he, you know what? I, I certainly say I haven't always got what I wanted, but He's never let me down. He, he's been, and you know what? I believe He'll be with me to the very end. If He comes and takes me home one day and, and, and calls us all out, that's, that's good. What a blessing. But you know what? When I'm facing death, I'm not going to have to say, what is it? My Lord will be with me. He'll hold my hand. He'll, he'll take me over. Well, what could be better? What? You know what it is? It's the mighty hand of God. You know what? You know what that wafer came down? And it wasn't, it wasn't steak and potatoes. It was the mighty hand of God. I will sustain you on the smallest thing I can think of. And he did it. Forty years. What about you? Are you well sustained this morning? Do you, do you even know of which I speak? The mighty God of all heaven? Jehovah is his name. Do you trust him fully with what you have? All we need to do that.